Are there any questions? Professor Kapp, uh, do you uh, permit another uh, the relativity theory model of the electrical uh, and uh, 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 this uh, alternative with a field uh, A, uh, field A, uh, uh, because uh, this alternative uh, was developed in your grid, uh, uh, Oliver Heaviside, and our great uh, Nikolai Zhukovsky uh, uh, 100 years ago. Uh, uh, why need this alternative? Uh, uh, it's my point of view. Uh, because uh, for dimensional Minkowski uh, space-time uh -huh. metric does not correspond to our real physical world. Real properties of the features of our real space and time. For example, all objects of the universe move in space in completely different ways, but their movement in time is completely the same. Consequently, uh, it is wrong uh, to add segments in space with segments in time. Uh, as done in the bilinear form of uh, Minkowski metric. And consequently, the four, uh, uh, four interval is not adequate to our physical reality and uh, cannot uh, uh, in any way uh, uh, by uh, a real physical invariant. Uh, this is the reason of this uh, uh, alternative. Okay, so you have to explain it because I'm, I'm not quite clear. Are you, are you disagreeing with special relativity, general relativity, or Big Bang, I'm not sure which features you're both, disagreeing with. Uh, both, both. Uh, because of, uh, uh, as I uh, believe, uh, four-dimensional Minkowski okay. yeah. metrics. Uh, well, let, let, let me just say, everything I talked about was in the context of standard relativity theory and standard cosmology. But I should say that, of course, the relevance of primordial black holes goes beyond that. When you're looking at the early universe, for example, we know standard relativity. Yeah. When you get back to the Planck time, we know standard relativity is going to break down. And we know that there might be extra dimensions. Maybe that's going in the wrong direction to make you happy. But, but nevertheless, the point is that whatever your theory is for, 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 for gravity and for high energy physics, primordial black holes in principle can probe it. Now, I don't know whether the theory you're advocating doesn't allow black holes at all, but I mean, there are other theories of gravity other than general relativity, and all those theories have, most of those theories do allow black holes, but they will have somewhat different characteristics. So, the point is that theories which are different from the standard one, I mean, I obviously come from a mainstream perspective, but theories which are different can still be interesting in so much as the formation of black holes in the early universe and probes those theories. So that's probably not the answer you're expecting, because I suspect that in the theory you're talking about, the black holes themselves may not exist. But all I'm saying is that, in principle, black holes can exist in, in a wide range of theories besides standard relativity theory. And, uh, and therefore, that's why it's, they can be interesting probes of those theories. Uh, as far as I uh, understand, uh, there are some indications that uh, it is a sum of uh, black holes which took part in this uh, light universe might have uh, spin before collapses. And uh, in that sense, it could be rather dangerous for the deviation of the world. Yeah.
the normal prime mover, the normal black holes to form from stellar matter, you, they form in binaries because we know that a large fraction of big stars form in binaries because that's the way the collapsing solar protosolar cloud will, will fragment. Things. And in fact, we know observations that the bigger, bigger stars are more likely to be in binaries. And therefore, in some sense, you expect primordial, you expect normal black holes to be in binaries. Whereas primordial black holes won't be, because they're normally an individual primordial black hole should not have much spin. And therefore, that's going to be a crucial way of distinguishing between the scenarios. Now, my understanding, I have a diagram which I didn't show you because I just cut it out because it's close to the time, but um, if you look at the distribution of the spins of the black holes, there seems to be an indication that the, individual, that the black holes have rather low spin. So some people had argued that this was I don't know how good the evidence is, we've only got we still only got five candidates. But uh, the point is that I think your point is really important because the, the spin, which you can measure from, from the whole point about these observations, why you're allowed to measure the spin of the black hole and the final black hole, I think that's going to be crucial to determine the origin. Uh, and because I think it will be one of the conditions of the primordial scenario that you don't expect much of so that's a very good point. And I think, you know, in another year or so, we're going to have a hundred of these events and then a hot innovation on that. You explained very, you explained very clearly that Pramoda uh, Black Holes all explored with great attraction and became great, yeah. or perhaps later evaporate for radiation. Yeah. So, as I did understand you correctly, that at present time, there is no chance to see micro black holes, primordial black holes. Exploding. Well, I, I, it's true. I said at one point that the gamma ray background observations imply that you don't expect to see black hole explosions. Um, because they're, the, the limits on the number of the black holes of, the, of that mass range is such that there won't be many explosions. But you have to treat that remark with caution. That's what we felt in 1976. But since then, it has been argued by certain people that actually some of the gamma ray bursts, short gamma ray bursts, may be exploding black holes. I'm referring to the work of uh, David Klein and people in uh, Los Angeles. He's, he's died recently, but David Klein wrote a lot of papers on this subject. And so, obviously, we, mo we know most gamma ray bursts are not exploding black holes. In fact, we know many gamma ray bursts are now these coalescing neutron stars. But it is possible that there's a subset of very short period gamma ray bursts which could be primordial black hole explosions. Now, I don't think that most people in the gamma ray community take that too seriously, but it is still a possibility. And from a theoretical perspective, you, you have to have some strange transition going on. If, if you want to make these black holes detectable, you have to have something going on at about the QCD phase transition again which is going to allow you to make the black holes more detectable than they would have been in the original simple Hawking picture. Because when, when, when Hawking decided that they weren't detectable, he was using his simple picture of black hole evaporation. But if you have a certain phase transition at a certain temperature, like the QCD temperature, it could produce a, a little feature in the, in the explosion feature of the black hole. So it's not completely ruled out that some of the prime... I know David Klein, I mean, he's dead now, so maybe he knows, but it's, it's not it completely excluded that some primordial black hole, some of these gamma ray bursts are primordial black hole explosions. But I have to say that my, my own personal interest has now shifted more to the non-exploding black holes. I mean, it's an interesting question I asked Stephen, actually. I wanted to ask Stephen, what would be most exciting if to find an exploding primordial black hole, which means that it verifies primordial black holes in Hawking radiation, or to find that all the dark matter is in more massive primordial black holes, in which case primordial black holes are fundamental to the universe. Now, I think if I'd asked Stephen that, he'd prefer, it, he'd prefer to find the exploding black hole. But I'd be quite excited if all the, black, if all the dark matter was in primordial black holes. I think that's the greater probability, to be honest, at the moment. 
I think it's more likely that I think we're more likely to find primordial black holes making the dark matter than we are to find the primordial black hole explosion. But either would be great. Just to continue, if dark matter is essentially primordial black holes, remnant black holes, then uh, they must be extremely stable. Ah, yes, I must make a distinction. When I'm talking about the dark matter being primordial black holes, I mean the primordial black holes which are much bigger than 10 to the 15 grams. Okay, so those windows I talked about, you know, the, the lunar mass window and the intermediate mass window, those, those are very stable because they're not evaporating by Hawking effects. There is another possibility which I alluded to, which is that when a primordial black hole evaporates, it stops evaporating when it gets down to the Planck mass. Because when you get to the Planck mass, then you know that the standard Hawking derivation doesn't work because you're in the quantum gravity regime. So some people have argued that maybe every evaporating black hole needs one Planck mass relic. And so there's another theory for the dark matter, which I did allude to very briefly, which says that maybe the dark matter is in stable Planck mass relics. So you're saying that the Hawking process stops at the Planck mass, so the stable relic is, the Planck mass is stable. Um, but that's very frustrating, because if the dark mass is in Planck mass objects, then, I mean, we'll never detect them. They're, they're so small, you know, it's the Planck length. It's, they're so small that we can only detect them through their gravitational interaction. So I'm rather hoping, if God has put the dark mass in Planck mass black holes, that's rather cruel, because we'll never be able to detect it as far as I'm aware. So I'm hoping it will be in larger ones. We have a question. Okay, okay. Uh, last final question. Uh, <laughs> some theoretical stuff. Does somebody, uh, did, uh, this, did somebody discuss the primordial wormholes connection with yes. primordial wormholes? Yes. Or it's not some words? Yes. Well, that's an interesting question, which actually that links to the part of the talk I didn't give. Um, there are, of course, there's a great interest in, in wormholes because of uh, the links with time machines and things like that. Uh, something for Igor. Igor, of course, Novikov has worked on a great deal. Um, and, and people have even speculated that the supermassive black holes in the centers of the galaxies may in fact be wormholes. So I think that the whole link between the wormholes and the black holes is, is, is quite interesting. I've been talking about primordial black holes, not primordial wormholes. But, but, but your question is important. But actually, the part of the talk I didn't discuss was the link what, the question is, what happens when you get down to the Planck mass? Okay. Um, traditionally, um, traditionally, you've got um, a minimum mass for a black hole, which is the Planck mass, because you've got the Compton, if you imagine your MR diagram, you've got the Compton wavelength, and you've got the short charge radius, and they met, meet at the Planck mass. And traditionally, people say, you can't have a black hole small than the Planck mass. Because it would, it would be, if, if it was less than the Planck mass, it would actually be smaller than the Compton wavelength. So the traditional view is that there is a sharp division between black holes and elementary particles at the Planck scale. But if you imagine this diagram where you've got the Compton wavelength and it hits the short charge radius, so you've got like a, a V. And you've got this sharp division. Personally, I think that is very unnatural. And I personally think the most natural scenario is one in which you have a continuation of the Compton line, so it merges with the Schwarzschild line. So you, you have a sort of continuous smooth, you have a continuum between particles and black holes. In that scenario, you have subplanking black holes, and you in some sense identify Subplanking black holes, elementary particles with subplanking black holes. So you actually argue that elementary particles are themselves black holes, but subplanking black holes. And there's actually quite a long history on this topic where people identified black holes with elementary particles. But it turns out that in this model, the, the, the model I favorite is, which does this, it turns out that they're actually not black holes, they're wormholes. Um, these, 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 
subplanckian objects, which are linking particles with black holes, they're wormholes. And, uh, and so your question is very relevant to that, because if you want to associate black holes with, with elementary particles, it's actually wormholes that are associated with them. Because these, these are what we call jewel black holes, that you, you look into them and you think it's a subplanckian, but when you go through, you find that it's actually in another universe. It's a, Big black hole. So, sorry, that's a little bit of a, 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 of a detour, but nevertheless, I wanted to uh, answer your interesting question by referring to that possibility. Thank you.